Thanks for tuning in uh, to Worldview. And uh, at the start of the year, we couldn't have asked for a better Worldview. We've got Howard Marks of Oak Tree. He needs no introduction. And Howard, it's an absolute pleasure for us to have you. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you, Niraj. Thank you. So, Howard, um, I'm I'm starting off this conversation with uh, a reference to the rate, the latest invest, the, the latest memo that you wrote, wherein you talked about the sea change and how uh, declining interest rates for nearly four decades being the second sea change and the latest one being the complete reversal of the conditions from 2009 to 2021. How do you think this impacts uh, 2023 uh, and the years ahead? both for the Western world and subsequently the emerging market world. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, a sea change, for those who don't know, is an idiom uh, used to describe a, a, a major transformation, a total change. And I think, I think you know, not, a, not a, an occasional cyclical fluctuation, a major change. And I think we may be going through one of those. As you mentioned, uh, the first one that I lived through occurred uh, in the years between 1980 and uh, uh, 2020. Uh, in 1980, for those who don't remember, uh, the interest rates in the States reached over 20%. Uh, Paul Volcker became chairman of the Fed. He had to raise rates in order to uh, snuff out inflation and inflationary thinking. Uh, uh, inflation is a, is a real menace. Uh, and uh, it has to be brought under control. And you, you do that by really by slowing the economy. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, Volcker did that. Um, as I say, I had a loan outstanding from a bank at the time. The, the rate on the loan hit 22 and a quarter in 1980. 40 years later, I was able to borrow at two and a quarter. So in other words, interest rates came down by 20% or what we call 2000 basis points. And uh, this has been a very strong uh, tailwind supporting uh, asset ownership, uh, subsidizing uh, borrowers, uh, enriching owners of assets, penalizing savers and lenders. And uh, this was uh, this prevailed for a very long time. And, uh, you know, so long, in fact, that uh, there are very few people around who who saw the world before it began, uh, you know, you had to be uh, in the 70s, which meant in, in our world, you had to be working in the 60s. You couldn't get a job in the 70s. So I got mine in the 60s and there aren't many of us around. Um, so this was a tremendous tailwind uh, that benefited certain strategies and penalized others. Uh, and it had other effects, of course. It, it, um, it produces risk taking because uh, very safe instruments uh, like treasuries uh, and cash yield close to zero. Nobody wants zero, so they have to go out the risk curve in order to get the kinds of returns they do want, and they have to take risk to get that. So that's that's one uh, form. Uh, there were many many ramifications. It, it was very people were eager to to uh, to uh, to do lending to risky companies, uh, which meant it very made it very easy for risky companies to grow. Uh, that's that's another effect. So uh, I think that uh, I'm not calling for a return to 20% interest rates. I, I, you know, right now the Fed funds rate in the states is about four and a quarter, and I think it'll stay in this vicinity. It may it'll go a little higher next year. They've indicated that there will be some more rate rises, uh, but nothing major. The, my main point is that it's not going back to what it used to be. You know, uh, to fight the global financial uh, crisis, the Fed dropped the Fed funds rate to zero uh, at the end of 08 uh, and kept it there for seven years. So people start to think, oh, I guess zero is the normal interest rate. Well, the point is it's not. And uh, uh, when you have a very strong economy abetted by low interest rates, then you don't have defaults and bankruptcies. That's not normal. Uh, it's not normally so easy to raise money if you're a low quality company. That's not normal. So uh, my point is that I'm, we're going back in my opinion, to a uh, normal times in which it's not so great for borrowers and asset owners, and it's not so bad for savers and lenders. Um, 
what are the implications for asset allocation in such a scenario, both for the Western world, Harvard? And then I would love for you to maybe dwell upon a little bit about the implications for emerging markets as well, wherein presumably uh, the, 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 the specter of growth could be slightly higher than what we might see uh, elsewhere, at least in the very near term. Well, from uh, uh, October of 2012 until February of 2020, I gave a speech. Uh, I, I, read, I changed the speech from time to time, but I didn't change the title. The title was living in a low return world or investing in a low return world. And the point is that, you know, most of what Oak Tree does is investing in debt, uh, bonds, loans, fixed income, credit. There are a lot of different names for it, but it's it's lending, basically. And you know, the, the, the loan, the, the, the interest rates on lending were very low. Um, and uh, as I said before, cash yielded zero. Put money in the bank, you got zero. Uh, some parts of the world, of course, you got negative. Uh, you, you bought treasuries, you got one or one and a half percent uh, and so forth. So nobody wants those kinds of returns. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was it, so... Uh, I recently saw a, a graph of the holdings of debt in one of the in major investment banks, high net worth group, and it basically went from 30 to 20 percent, uh, uh, the holdings of, ca of uh, cash and, and equivalent securities. Uh, you know, people just didn't want it. And so uh, you, you couldn't get a livable uh, income uh, from debt. Uh, now you can. Uh, so I think that debt can, and of course, debt is is much safer than equities. Equities has upside. Debt doesn't have upside, but debt has uh, a, a guaranteed return, assuming that the that the issuer is money good, and it has uh, um, stability. Uh, uh, you have a promise of repayment, um, and it has safety. So uh, I think now uh, you know. Now there's a, a much better place for debt in asset allocation than there was one or two years ago or, or five years ago. Uh, a year ago, you know, one of the things that we deal with is, is called high yield bonds. Those are the bonds of, of, of companies that are below investment grade. Investment grade is, is a triple A, double A, single A, triple B. That's investment grade. Everything below that is non-investment grade or speculative, starting with double B, single B, then the C's and the D's and the F's, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, Oak Tree uh, uh, is a pioneer in high yield bonds. We've been at it uh, for 44 years, uh, which, which goes back to the beginning of that business. A year ago, high yield bonds yielded a, a, a four and something. Well, most of my clients need 7% returns. They're pension funds or endowments or insurance companies or something like that. And they need seven. They can't make much use of things that yield four with no upside. So uh, it was very difficult for them, difficult for us. Today, those bonds yield eight. Now they have a real use in our portfolios. So uh, that's just an example. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, if you can get returns the returns you need with a heavy allocation to credit or, or debt, uh, you don't have to go into risky strategies uh, for those things. People had to do that in the in the teens because uh, they used to say, Tina, uh, there is no alternative to stocks. Uh, I, I used to call those people handcuffed volunteers. They were going into risky investments, not because they wanted to, but because they had to, to get the returns they needed. Now they don't have to do it to get the returns they need. So I think this is going to change. You'll probably have less money in equities and less money in alternatives such as private equity. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody that we were talking to coined this, not coined really, but spoke about this term that uh, we, we it's time to move from Tina to Tara. There are reasonable alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. So, so Howard, uh, implications therefore, I and mean, I mean, for for for, I mean, I would dwell, love for you to dwell a little bit upon equities as well, and then we'll come to the economy. But I'm just wondering. So, if emerging markets would have enjoyed a flow of liquidity because money had to flow to high yielding assets. Right. 
yeah. like EM, uh, current EM debt and maybe EM equity, do you yes. reckon uh, it might be a headwind for yeah. emerging markets because money may find its space in safety in in US credit, for example? As right, right. Well, you know, I, I, I think I think that that is a reasonable uh, conclusion on your part. Uh, I think that you know we have the we have the safe assets where you can get a steady return uh, with assurance, uh, and though and that return is now what I would call adequate. And then you have the other things that people went to to get re the returns when they couldn't get them uh, uh, safely and 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 easily. And emerging markets were emerging market equities were among those. Uh, so. Uh, you know, by implication, it should be harder for the for the uh, emerging markets to get finance. Um, now, one of the things that happened in the last 20 years, you know, we went in 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 in, in 2001 and two, the U.S. stock market went down for three years in a row, the first time since 1938, and people were really uh, disaffected um, in terms of stocks and and uh, and uh, you know, they they were turned off to, to the stock market, and the Fed dropped dropped bond rates very low uh, to fight uh, the recession that ensued. So if the if the if people were turned off to stocks and and bonds had low uh, rates of return, then that's why people were forced to go out the risk curve into so-called alternatives. And one of the things they went into was emerging market uh, stocks and and debt the flow of capital to emerging markets the enhanced flow enabled a lot of emerging market countries to issue debt denominated in dollars and of course this is not normally the case because these are countries that don't produce dollars uh and so repaying dollar debt can be very challenging and uh, uh, but but if you can borrow in dollars which these countries were able to do then you pay lower interest rates. So that was a that was a benefit for them at that time. The challenge now is that debt is going to come due, and they're going to have to pay it off in dollars. And many of them don't produce dollars in the normal course of business, or they do it through imports. But if they if we have a recession throughout the world, uh, then the uh, people will probably buy less from the emerging markets. They'll do. They'll do less exporting, in which case they'll bring in fewer dollars. Uh, so, you know, it, I think that the the outlook for dollars is similar. When I say that we're going into normal times in which life is not so easy, I think the emerging markets will be among those that feel uh, the, the that revision. Life is just not going to be as easy as it was uh, uh, you know, for most of the last 20 years. Wow. Also, uh, just a, a follow up here, uh, Howard, do you think uh, investors in general, uh, even currently underappreciate the combined effects of this sea change coupled with the withdrawal of liquidity that central banks are, are underway currently? You know, that's a great question, Iraj, and I think the answer is no. Uh, uh, first of all, as I said, um, we've had the, the basic conditions I described, this ease of getting money, of uh, running companies, of growing, et cetera, uh, freedom from defaults and bankruptcies, et cetera. We've had that since the end of the global financial crisis, uh, 08, 09. Um, a lot of people, you know, memories are short in the financial uh, world, and a lot of people can't remember uh, anything be beyond uh, earlier than, let's say, 08. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, interest rates have been declining for the last 40 years, or actually 42, because the peak was 1980, 42 years ago, 43. Uh, very few people remember the financial conditions in, in, before 1980. So um, yes, I think that many people feel that that the, that the the conditions of the last 13 years, in particular, are normal, 
and that we're going to go back to normal. And you know, it, 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 I, I don't, I don't really believe in in the ability to foretell the future, mm -hmm. including my own ability to foretell the future. You know, I do this with great trepidation, uh, but um, it's just my feeling uh, that. You know, as I said, the, the Fed kept, kept interest rates at zero for seven years. I don't think they're happy to do that. I don't think they're happy to go back there. There were a lot of reasons why uh, why zero rates are not a good idea. It it does encourage inflation. It does make it too easy for borrowers and too bad for savers. And and uh, uh, you know, one of the ways the Fed solves problems when they arise in the economy is by reducing interest rates. Well, if your interest rate is zero, you can't reduce interest rates. Mm -hmm. So, and 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 uh, you know, zero interest rates tend to keep companies alive that shouldn't stay alive. You know, we, we the, the, the one of the beauties of capitalism is is that it's Darwinian, it's survival of the of the fittest. But in in a zero rate environment, the unfit can stay alive. That's not a good thing. You know, I, I once said in one of my memos that that fear of bankruptcy is to capitalism as fear of hell is to Catholicism, you know, and and people should have to make difficult capital allocation decisions and not get money for nothing. Uh, anyway, that's a long uh, and, I, you know, there's in the memo that you see change, there's a long list of the salutary effects of low interest rates and a, and a list of the reasons why we shouldn't go back to zero. Uh, and and uh, and so I, I think that. Uh, Oh, and the last thing I'll say is that most people in the financial community are optimistic by nature. Uh, no, that's true. And, uh, you know, uh, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner, always quotes the philosopher Demosthenes, who said, for that which a man wishes, that he will believe. So there's a lot of wishful thinking. Uh, and and uh, so, yes, I think that people are are holding to optimism and belief that we're going back to the ways of the teens. Uh, when when I think we're not. And by the way, so what I say in the memo, uh, and I know you know this because you've read it, is I don't I don't say rates are going to 20, as I said, or to 10 or to eight or to six. I say they're going to be, be stay between two and four, not zero and two. That's the whole difference. Uh, and 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 we'll see. I mean, if they go if they go back to zero, then I'm wrong. And but uh, but of course, if they go back to zero, I'll make a lot of money because because financial assets become very valuable. Uh, but that that's really my part of my uh, point of departure. Hmm. Um, how about just uh, um, a, a one more follow up here, a short one at that. There is also a belief that I mean, no, let's assume that we're not talking about going back to zero. But currently, if it's assumed that uh, and, and the Fed wants the market to believe that, hey, the rates are going to be much higher than what the market is wanting. I mean, yeah. uh, the minutes sounded almost frustrated that the market is going in with some hopes every meeting of a rate cut. Yeah. But my question is this, that if indeed inflationary pressures have ebbed a little bit, and with these layoffs that we're seeing, if indeed the stubbornly high wage inflation also shows sign of cooling, could there be a pivot part one, a small one at that? And could risk assets like US equities, for example, start looking attractive at a particular valuation simply because they've yeah. had a very tumultuous 2022 any which ways. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. If And I say in the memo that the, you know, a lot, inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods. That's the classic definition. And b thanks to the uh, thanks to the pandemic, we have too much money because the government gave out a lot of money to ease people's suffering and they couldn't spend it. So they put it in the bank. So there's too much money in, in people's savings accounts and too few goods because the supply chain has started up a little haltingly. And those influences will abate over time. The extra money will get spent. The, the supply chain will catch up. So yes, it, so inflation will abate. Uh, whether it goes right all the way back to less than two again, we'll see. Um, but it, and if it does abate, then by, I think by definition we'll have fewer interest rate increases than we otherwise would have had. Right now, right now, uh, you know, in his last pronouncement, Powell, Chairman Powell said we're going to have more increases, but smaller than people had thought over a longer period of time than people had thought. It, it gave the impression that rates will will be going up throughout 2023. 
but if you're right, if 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 inflation abates, it then they can pivot uh, and become less hawkish. High interest rates we call hawkish as opposed to dovish uh, uh, sooner. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it, it could happen. Who knows? Uh, now, you 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 remind me of your second question. So my question, therefore, was: Does that make at some valuation U.S. Yeah. Yeah. equity markets yeah. attractive as well because they had a bad 2022 yeah. interest rates? Yes. Well, declining interest rates have a tendency to increase the value of assets. The 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 value of an asset is the discounted present value of the future right. cash flows. Yeah. And if you discount the future cash flows at a lower interest rate, then they're worth more. So there's a direct influence. And you know all investors and all markets get very happy uh, when they see interest rates coming down. Yeah, um, sure. and, and, it, and it could happen. And as you say, the US stock market, uh, if, if interest rates coming down start coming down, the US stock market uh, there's some point, uh, some valuation at which it's extremely attractive. I don't think it's quite there yet because the valuations are, um, the, the, we, we value stocks basically on what's called the price earnings ratio. And the, the price earnings ratio right now is higher than it historically has been on average. Uh, so they're not cheap. Um, and the other thing is that uh, most people think we're gonna have recession thanks to the Fed's actions. And uh, that recession will cause earnings to decline, which by itself causes the price earnings ratio to increase, making them uncheap. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things have to happen well uh, for stocks to, uh, to perform extremely well. Got it. How about, could the construct be different for economies like India or markets like India? Because the risk free rate is not 8%. Tax rates are 30% on a 7.5% debt uh, income and earnings growth in equities may be early double digits at least, if not more. So therefore, can there be a more constructive a case built in an otherwise very different world for risk assets of the 2000, which was similar to the 2009 to 2021 period? Can India or some other economies like that be slightly different than the normal case being built for equities? Well, now is my time. And Niraj to make give my disclaimer that I'm no expert on India, uh, and and you know I I I I don't claim any particular expertise other than the fact that I've been working in the financial markets for a long time. Uh, I'm a believer in India. Uh, I, I you know we we have said for many years the uh, the financial community has said for many years that India is gonna be a great place someday uh, for investing when they get their act together you know when they get their act together from time to time we've hoped that that time had come uh we hope it's here now as you know morgan stanley put out a very positive report on india I, I, and uh, you know i uh, i'm persuaded by its uh arguments uh but they have to come true uh -huh. you know uh, uh, -huh. uh you know digitization uh power uh renewables um and uh you know things like that uh india's got the potential it's got the human resources uh and uh you know it, it should get there uh it has to it has to have good government uh no corruption or less corruption um uh and and uh good organization not too much red tape uh not too much bureaucracy um uh, and uh, you know it, it it it's a capitalist country it should work well now uh there there are times in the past when i've heard people say that that uh china is a, a communist country that functions like a capitalist country and india is a capitalist country that functions like a socialist country uh it, if it could, if it can get its act together, if it can become efficient, and and a good place to do business, not as I say, not too much red tape, not too much uh, uh, complication. Why shouldn't India uh, have great growth? Look at what happened to China. 
Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, India, India was a problem. I think I'm not an expert, but I imagine that 30, 40 years ago, India was ahead of China. Uh, you know, uh, we had in China, you had millions of people starving to death and eating grass. And uh, but China got it together. And and uh, so this is the kind of economic miracle that can be produced. I'd love to see it happen in India. I like India. Uh, uh, I have friends there. I visited there. Uh, uh, 2017, I think it was. And, uh, you know, I wrote some of my latest book in India uh, on that trip. Um, I talk about, I think, being in, uh, uh, what was it, Udaipur, uh, wow. and lying in bed at night uh, and, and getting ideas. I'm all for it. I'd love to see it. Okay, great. Um, one final question then, Howard, um, and, and which is, more from a perspective of um, how um, how basically um, the 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 an earnings growth led argument in certain EMs uh, would would it be compelling enough in a world that we're talking about wherein money would want to flow maybe to risk free assets like the U.S. debt or U.S. equities relatively simply because they are offering value. Uh, but there is growth in select markets. So do you think value will triumph or continue to triumph over growth in 2023 and beyond as it is done in 2022? Or is it difficult well, to call to make right now? Well, you know, from time to time, look, uh, are you talking about the emerging markets or in general? In general, emerging markets, okay. or any market in general. You know, uh, Growth investing, investing based on the expected rapid growth of earnings of the companies, is a is an optimistic uh, activity. You know, uh, obviously, the, it, it, people up uh, up uprate uh, those stocks when they're confident that the growth is going to be there. They take them down when they get worried. So it, it it reflects a lot the the psychological mood, and uh, and uh, it it. And that that mood fluctuates a great deal with regard to the emerging markets, uh, and uh, I think they're at a rather and and they're at a somewhat of a low ebb now, and in particular, of course, the uh, the 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 uh, pace of business in the emerging markets is largely affected by the pace of business in the developed world, and and most and mo much of the developed world is in a recession or projected to go into one within the next year or so. So that reflects badly on EMs, but that's why they're down now. And EMs stocks had a very poor year. Right? Were they down 30%? Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, one of these days, number one, the facts will improve. And number two, people's view of the facts will improve. Uh, and and that's a, so that will be a double benefit for the EM stocks someday. Can't tell you when. Uh, but if we're not in, if we're, if we're not, you know, uh, I think that, that value did better than growth in 22. And if 23 is a pessimistic, pessimistic uh, year, it might do better in, in 23. Um, but, you know, the, the emerging markets, one of these days, places like India are going to have a great growth story. Um, and, um, and, and uh, so, uh, you know, I think I think we can be optimistic if if we have a lot of patience. Okay, but yeah, <laughs> timing that is just nearly impossible. But Howard Marks, if it's difficult for you, it's almost impossible for most people. So <laughs> I, I take that argument very constructively. Thank you so much for talking to us today and wishing you and team uh, a very, very happy and a productive 2023. Thank you, Raj. It, it was great speaking with you. Your questions are right on the mark. And uh, I look forward to the next time we speak. Um, thank you so much. That's music to the ears. I'm sure a lot of viewers in India look forward to hearing you more often. So thank you for Good. this. Thank you. Bye-bye.